Okay, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's 11 o'clock. So I'm going to start the session because we have a lot to get through and I want to make sure everyone has uh, time for questions today. My name is Dr. Karen Gelb. I work at Pennington Institute. And on behalf of Pennington Institute, I'd like to welcome you all today to our session and just remind people to make sure you're on mute for the session. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of all the different lands from which we're joining the session today. I'm speaking from the land of the Boon peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, we're gonna to be talking about performance and image enhancing drugs. We're gonna look at what they are, who uses them, their risks and benefits, and what professionals who interact with consumers should know about them. We are very lucky today to have three speakers. We have Bjorn joining us. Bjorn is a person whose expertise is based on their lived experience. We have Dr. Ben Yu and Dr. Maya Underwood, who are two of Australia's foremost experts about performance and image enhancing drugs. We're going to save the questions for Drs. Yu and Underwood until the end of the seminar, but we will have the opportunity to ask questions of Bjorn immediately after the presentation as they do need to leave the session once they're done. We'd like if possible for you to submit your questions via the chat and we'll be, we'll be monitoring that for you. We're also gonna ask you to complete a short evaluation of the seminar. We will drop the link into the chat we're going to do it now and we're going to do it. Uh, thank you. There's the link right there. And we're going to do it again at the end of the session. If you could uh, take about a minute or so to complete the survey before you leave the Zoom, that would be greatly appreciated. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Beng Yu. Beng is a GP and a, the co-director of the Paran Market Clinic. Beng has interests in drug and alcohol medicine and sports medicine. He was a lead contributor to the recently published GP Guide to Harm Minimization for patients using non-prescribed anabolic androgenic steroids and other performance and image enhancing drugs. He's also currently completing an audit, the PUSH audit, which collects information on people who are taking performance and image enhancing drugs and on its adverse effects in a number of sites across Australia. So Ben will be giving us an overview of what performance and image enhancing drugs are. And over to you, Ben, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Penn Institute for having this interesting forum. Just do my share screen. Okay, I assume everyone, is it clear for everyone there? All right, excellent. So. Just the first part is a 10 minute introduction into the topic before we get into the more details. So I thought it would be just to get everyone sort of up to speed, um, just with a very short introduction. We talk about performance and image enhancing drugs. Most people know all about the anabolic or anabolic androgenic steroids, which include testosterone, you know, nandrolone, DECA, and the other ones I've listed there. And this really represents 80 to 90% of all performance and image enhancing drugs that are being used. There are other things, as you can see on the right side of the umbrella, which is other hormones, which is HGH is human growth hormone. And they're also synthetic human growth hormones, which is HGH, like um, there's SAMs, which is the newer agents being used, which there's not that much information about yet. There's insulin growth factor one as well that's being used. Apart from that, there's also um, peptides which are being used, insulin, and there's this whole area of post cycle therapy, which we'll talk about later on. I just want to highlight insulin because we don't have enough focus on it, but actually it is one of the agents which actually can cause significant harm. You know, there is last week there was a coroner's inquest into a case where someone had insulin in a gym by himself and actually passed away from that. So we need to always remember some of these, even if, it, even if it's not common, it has significant side effects, obviously. There we go. Um, this is just a quick picture to show. On the left-hand side in the middle is the molecule for testosterone. And all the molecules around it are basically modified molecules that have different activity for 
know, building muscle. So basically, you know, clever scientists have created different chemicals which mimic the testosterone molecule, trying to actually reduce the side effects from um, uh, for the testosterone-like effects. That's all. Um, how are they used generally? Mostly, they are intramuscular injections. They're more common done in the gluteal muscle, sometimes in the thigh, and occasionally in the deltoid. Obviously, deltoid is probably not less preferable, but I think for some people with a really large deltoid, they do use that. And I think most people tend to try and rotate the side so there's not too much scarring there. There is some oral use. Um, some anabolic steroids, some testosterone is used orally. You know, oral use is associated with more side effects, particularly liver toxicities. And the whole area of post psychotherapy generally is oral tablets with that. There's also subcutaneous use. You know, like I said before, insulin is usually injected subcutaneously. Um, but I've also heard there's a practice of people using anabolic steroids subcutaneously as well. The common thing, the common traditional way of using it is on cycles, three months on and off is the traditional way people use it. The idea being in the off cycle, your natural levels of testosterone will actually uh, recover. Um, there's also a way of using it, which is called blast and cruise, where people use a blast cycle of high, do of high doses of anabolic steroids, and then they cruise where they actually come down to replacement levels or lower levels of, test of testosterone over that period. Some people just use it continuously after a while. Um, there's also the concept of stacking, which is um, about combining different anabolic steroids for presumably different effects of them. So they use multiple anabolic steroids at the same time in a very, sometimes in a quite complicated combination and pulse psychotherapy. So pulse psychotherapy is basically using agents to stimulate natural testosterone levels after use of anabolic steroids. It's also used to prevent depletion of, of um, testosterone levels and also to treat adverse effects. So common things we will talk about is tamoxifen or Novadex, um, clomiphene or clomid, HCG, cyclophenil, anestrozole. Let's also talk about SARMs being used for this, but I haven't had much information about that yet. So this is often used after a cycle to help recovery of testosterone, but sometimes used during the cycle to reduce side effects as well. Um, often it's a very complex dosing schedule that people look at online. In the past, you know, medical people have poo-pooed this whole idea of using PCT, but actually these agents are sometimes used by endocrinologists and people with testosterone deficiency. So there's definitely some merit in it. I think it's just that we're not sure how it should be used. How common is um, PEDS use in Australia? Just some quick things to run through. Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission data report. This is the latest report that's released in the last few months for the 2018-19 data. So as you can tell, this fabulous steroid seizures come off the peak from the 2013-2014 period. And when they, the, the blue bars, which are hormones, is things like um, erythropoietin, human growth hormone, and things like that. So in the 2018-19, which is the most recently reported um, data, over 4,600 detections, so specific detections. 68% of it was anabolic steroids, and 32% was hormones, so growth hormone, HCG, and EPO. So in that year, 21.3 kilograms was actually seized. Um, so what does 21.3 kilogram actually represent? So using a very rough estimate where a common use would be um, testosterone enantate, for example, where for hormone replacement, we tend to use 250 milligrams per uh, fortnight, but a lot of people will use it uh, off prescription, use probably 500 milligrams per week. So using that dose, 221 uh, kilograms equates to 85,000 doses which using that sort of dose, dosing regimen would supply, you know, close to 1,800 people for 12 months. Apart from that, I think as a lot of you know, the Australian Needle and Syringe Program, you know, collects self-reported information. And um, the question about last drug injected being uh, performance image enhancing drugs, the levels fluctuates between 2% and to 7%. The other thing that gives us some idea about um, incidents uh, of use would be the Australian Secondary Schools um, survey. So this is a big sample size, 20,000 of 12 to 17 year old secondary school students. Um, the last survey was still 2017, so this is still the latest report. So the question of performance enhancing drugs, it says only it, between two and 3%, depending on which year you look at, of all students that ever used these kind of drugs without prescription. 
1% reported using it at the time of, in the past month with of the survey. But you know, 3% of students actually equates to 48,000 students, which is quite a large number if you actually calculate that out. And even 1% using it within the last month of the survey is 16,000. So I think that the number falls in between a little bit because I think most people don't use it continuously. So maybe about 30,000 of um, um, secondary students might, might be using it. Total population estimates, no one has done one. I think easily 150, 200,000 um, people in Australia are using it. And where are they coming from? China is the largest point of supply. So it's different to Europe where it's Eastern European countries. And other points are the US, UK, India, Singapore, Thailand, Turkey. And it usually comes in on uh, international mail, not surprisingly, anecdotally, this is what everyone tells me too. Um, a small number come by air cargo and some by passenger or crew, but most of it is through the mail system. So I suppose I wonder how much of it is not being picked up. Why do people use improved performance for training and recovery? This is where the sports issues come in. For muscle gains for either body image or muscle competitions. There's also a use for anti-aging, wellness, more energy, especially in men you know, over 40. And testosterone replacement. A number of people come in who say that you know, their, test their testosterone was low and they started on anabolic steroids because of it. Quite a few of these young men have ended up actually referring to endocrinologists and it's been found to have a testosterone deficiency. So they eventually end up on prescribed testosterone as a result. All right, so this is a quick introduction. Let me back over. Thank you very much for that, Ben. Uh, that's, uh, that was very useful to have. I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Maya Underwood, who's an anthropologist at the University of Queensland. Uh, Maya has a special interest in body modifications and other body work. She is especially interested in tattoo and the building of muscle and how they can be used to negotiate social relations. Maya has published widely on topics such as online bodybuilding communities, bloodborne viruses, life extension, and health. Maya is going to talk to us today about harm reduction from the perspective of the user. Maya, um, over to you. Thanks, Karen, and thanks to the Institute for having me on board and taking an interest in my research. Now, I'm just... Okay, I'm hoping you can all see PowerPoint now. Um, apologies, I've changed my title a little from what was advertised. I wanted to talk about harm and benefit as well as harm reduction. I realised I can't fit it all in. And also, apologies, I'm not conforming to the Australian norm of using PEED, um, performance and image enhancing drugs. I prefer image and performance enhancing drugs because it puts image first, and that's the reason most people use these drugs. And just because I don't like the sound of peed, you know, it, when we use it in a talk, it's peed here, peed there, it sounds like incontinence. So I want to talk to you about iPads from the user perspective. But firstly, who am I and why have I been asked to speak at this event? Well, I'm an anthropologist. That just means I study culture and anthropologists live like the people that they study so that they can understand how they live. So I've been immersed in online enhancement communities for a bit over four years. I've been hanging out in online forums, on YouTube and in closed Facebook groups, um, talking with and observing enhanced bodybuilders in particular. I've talked to hundreds of enhanced bodybuilders, I've observed thousands and had in-depth communication with 34 enhanced recreational bodybuilders. Three of these I've had especially deep and in-depth conversations ongoing um, monthly, sometimes weekly, even daily for years and I call these individuals key cultural consultants. You'll hear from one of these today and that is Bjorn always going by the name Bjorn today for privacy reasons. So today I'm going to describe what I've learned about iPad harm reduction from the enhanced bodybuilders perspective. Despite the importance of consumer engagement in drug harm reduction, there's been very little engagement with people who use iPads. 
steroid reduction has been primarily conceptualized from an outside perspective. People who use iPads have been constructed as risk takers and are seen as recipients of care rather than as actors in harm reduction. As a result, there are two quite distinct discourses on iPad harm reduction, the outside and the inside. The outside perspective on iPad harm reduction is primarily based on science, it's more objective and detached, and it has baggage. Science has in the past denied the benefits of these drugs and continued to do so up until as late as the year 2000. And it's since largely ignored the benefits of these drugs, instead overtake, overstating the risks and the harms. This denial of benefit and exaggeration of harm has resulted in a divide between people who use IP. The outside perspective has focused on issues like bloodborne virus, because that's what we do with other drug harm reduction. My research participants find this focus on bloodborne virus offensive and stigmatizing because they see themselves as different from other drug users, and in many ways they are. They suggest that this focus on bloodborne virus demonstrates an ignorance of the range of risks involved and avoids the complexity of the issue of iPad harm reduction, that it results in ineffective services because people who inject iPads are deterred from engaging with health services and academics. And it increases existing divides between bodybuilders on the one hand and service providers and academics on the other. The user perspective on iPad harm reduction has been given very little attention and we know very little about what they already do to reduce harm. Isolated harm reduction strategies have been described in the academic literature, but there has been no comprehensive overview of iPad um, harm reduction from the user perspective until now. My research participants know how to prevent bloodborne virus they are more concerned with the life-threatening long-term risks of iPad use, namely heart health, cholesterol, liver function, blood pressure and high hematocrit levels. They're more concerned with these than they are with bloodborne virus. They are probably most concerned and understandably so with the more immediate and likely harms that are the result of hormone imbalances things like mood swings, changes in energy levels, changes in libido and sexual function, gynecomastia, et cetera. These are what they term sides or side effects of these drugs. They're most concerned with the things that they can do something about. They do have injection related concerns, but they are about the harms that they are more likely to experience than bloodborne virus, such as post injection pain, abscess, and bacterial infection. They would prefer service providers talk to them about infection in general rather than bloodborne virus specifically. That way, you're still preventing infections of all kinds. And by moving the focus away from bloodborne virus specifically, it reduces their feelings of stigmatization. As I'm sure any of you who have used drugs or who have worked with drug users know, people who use drugs define harm reduction differently from most people who do not use drugs. From an outside expert perspective, harm reduction is purely about the reduction of harm. This is the perspective that's likely to be taken by researchers and health professionals. Harm reduction to these people is something outside experts help people who use drugs to do. But for the users of the drug, harm reduction is about reducing harm and maximizing benefit. It's about the balance of benefit to harm. In contrast, the inside perspective on harm reduction or, or what I've termed grounded harm reduction is about harm reduction as it is experienced on the ground. It's about reducing the harms while still experiencing the benefits that inform use. It's about altering the ratio of harm to benefit. 
It's a more subjective perspective on harm reduction as it's based on how the individual negotiates the balancing of harm to benefit based on their own particular values, norms and beliefs. It may be informed by science, sometimes imperfectly as I'll discuss, but it is primarily practice-based. If we think of harm reduction in this grounded way as about altering the ratio of harm to benefit, we can see that every person who uses drugs is always already engaged in harm reduction. This is what my presentation is about. How people who use iPads are already engaged in harm reduction before any expert intervenes. There are a couple of things that make the user perspective on iPad harm reduction really interesting. Now, people who use iPads are extremely diverse. And I'm talk, I've been talking to a specific segment of this population. The individuals who participate in my research are definitely at the more risk averse end of the spectrum. They have been described in the literature as expert users. They're building their bodies in very careful and considered ways and they like to use science to do so. These individuals really want to practice iPads in an evidence-based way and often desire the support of well-informed health professionals. The emphasis on science in iPad use is relatively recent with the advent of what has been termed online an age of enlightenment. There has been a very clear shift in the collective mindset of strength culture. It's no longer enough to know that things work. It's become far more important to know why they work. Over the course of the past two decades, research has gained an almost deific status in the fitness industry. Studies are considered by many to be the final word on any issue. So in this age of enlightenment, it has become relatively common in bodybuilding discussions to link to the publicly available abstract of scientific papers in PubMed when debating the harms, benefits of iPads or how to reduce their harms. The problem is that there is very little science on which to base iPad practice. There is virtually no research into the doses and combinations of drugs that most iPad users use. Science has different priorities to bodybuilding. Scientists are typically trying to treat, prevent or reduce harm, not enhance the body. So when there is science on these drugs, it's about these drugs being used in very different ways and for very different purposes than what enhanced bodybuilders use them for. For example, testosterone is researched as a tool to treat those with low testosterone, not as a tool to enhance. Insulin to treat diabetes, not as an anabolic agent. Tamoxifen as a preventative treatment for breast cancer in women, not as a tool to correct hormonal imbalances caused by enhancement drug use. Because there isn't enough science to adequately inform practice, enhanced bodybuilders theorize on the basis of the existing science and test these theories and attempt to fill the gaps in knowledge through their own experimentation. While experimentation is done at an individual level, these experiments are compared and contrasted online and thus a shared knowledge of these drugs is developed. This experiential knowledge is brought together with interpretations of the science to make bro science. And as one of my participants defined it, bro science is a practical template for bodybuilding based on a combination of the available theoretical scientific evidence, either directly or as correctly or incorrectly interpreted by third parties and the results of self-experimentation and the experiences of others who have, have experimented on themselves or others before in order to come to a working applicable whole for purposes of training, nutrition, supplement or iPad use. As found by other researchers, most individuals I spoke to would ideally practice iPads whilst in open and honest communication with a non-judgmental and well-informed health professional who is working from a solid scientific foundation, who supervises use and monitors health and assists with the prevention and treatment of harm, 
including the provision of regular blood work to de determine the effectiveness of use and the actual or potential harms. Ideal practices include the prevention or treatment of harm, including, um, as Ben said, PCT, uh, aromatase inhibitors and phlebo phlebotomy or bloodletting if necessary. While ideal practices include these harm reduction strategies, there is much debate in these communities about when these harm reduction strategies should be performed. While some enhanced bodybuilders do receive the care they desire, they appear to be in the extreme minority. The health professionals that provide these services are often doing so at risk to themselves, given that this support is typically an improper use of resources at best or illegal at worst. As Tony said, I see my family doctor here who is young, fresh out of med school and helps me with all my steroid related issues. He prescribes Clomid for my recovery. He prescribes dopamine agonists for when I'm injecting nandrolones. I have unlimited free blood work, constant ECGs, the works. He has it all locked away in a hidden digital file and told me to never go to any of the doctors in the office that he shares as they wouldn't understand. So despite the desire for support, enhanced bodybuilders typically do not engage with health professionals in their harm reduction efforts. There are numerous reasons for this. Uh, if they're in a country where iPads are illegal, they may experience fear caused by the illeg illegality of use. As Mason said, if they do go to the doctor, they lie about what they're doing. How can a doctor fix you if you mislead them? They may feel judged or misunderstood by health professionals. They may feel more knowledgeable than health professionals. As Bjorn said, although I feel relatively capable of evaluating the risks involved, at the end of the day, I'm not qualified in the slightest and I'm certainly not an endo. There is a huge amount of information I don't know and I'd rather feel dumb and have someone better informed educate me than be the one who has to lead blind GPs in monitoring health. The fact that I know more than most users and some GPs genuinely unsettles me. I know enough to know I don't know much at all. And, when I, and what I don't know could be very important. Furthermore, the support enhanced bodybuilders desire has not been proven to be effective scientifically and is likely never to be proven scientifically because as I said, science has very different priorities to bodybuilding. And as Jack said, in the end, general practitioners and even endo endocrinologists don't know anything. There hasn't been the medical research done into it really. A doctor can't say to you, take this drug, it will stop side effects because they can't legally do it. Even if steroids were legal, if it hasn't been proven through clinical trials, they can't say it. GPs are evidence-based practitioners. Online iPad communities are often used to address these shortfalls in knowledge and support. In online spaces such as forums or in closed social media groups, people who use iPads gather to practice harm reduction. They form communities of practice and share ways to maximize benefit whilst reducing harm. While much discussion is focused <laughs> on maximizing benefit, there's also a fair amount of encouragement to practice caution. For example, in response to a post from a bodybuilder beginning use of Trenbolone at 400 milligrams, one bodybuilder responded, way too much trend for your first time with the drug. I got tremendous results from 120 milligrams of Tren E. Tren isn't a drug to just fuck around with. Unless you have a contest in the next eight weeks, I'd drop it completely or cut dose in half. There is considerable discussion of ways to treat, prevent or reduce harm in online communities. Discussions are focused on practice. So when it comes to harm reduction, discussions are mostly focused on those harms of the drug that are very likely or certain and more immediate, what they tend to term signs or side effects than with the possible long-term harms about which they can do little. In line with the dawning of the age of enlightenment, there is an increasing expectation that individuals who practice iPads have regular blood work performed. As Callum said, 
like eight years ago when I started using, I barely saw a thing about blood work. But nowadays it's huge. A lot of people do it. If you don't have access to blood work, I don't think you should touch AAS because you're playing with fire at that point. Sorry, I've got some noise coming through. Someone's not on mute. Um, the, the results of blood work may be posted online for discussion. Indeed, if an individual complains of side effects in an online forum, they're commonly asked by other community members to provide their blood work. Sorry, I'm getting really um, distracted by the noise. Could we please have it muted? Thank you. Um, indeed, if an individual complains of side effects, they're commonly asked by other community members to provide their blood work. So members of the community can attempt to explain their experience of side effects. Because accessing blood work can be difficult um, because GPs feel unable to or are reluctant to provide it, private companies are sometimes used. That is an individual will pay um, for a a referral, uh, they will go have their blood drawn and the results will be sent back to this private company who will pass them on to the individual who uses the drugs. And then they uh, have to interpret the results themselves or in consultation with other community members. The IPED community has even crowdfunded labs for this purpose. Phlebotomy is sometimes advised by members of the community to reduce high hematocrit. In order to let blood safely, some advise individuals to lie about being an injecting drug user in order to donate blood and thus obtain a professional phlebotomy. There is much uncertainty amongst bodybuilders about the risks of these donations to individuals who may receive their blood. It's in this environment of sharing knowledge and practice that harm can be reduced significantly, but harms can also be caused. There is a great deal of uncertainty in these communities. There are some who act as community experts and are trusted by members of these communities to interpret the science and theorize from it and to provide that practical template for bodybuilding practice. Trusted experts tend to combine a body that demonstrates that their knowledge leads to results and ability to talk the science convincingly. Whether that's accurately or not is a, I am not sure, but they, they, they speak about the science convincingly enough that other people follow them. These community experts have varying levels of education and ability to interpret the science. Some are criticized as PubMed ninjas, um, that is those who cherry pick from the scientific literature and make invalid extrapolations. There does appear to be considerable room for harm as a result of ill advice. For example, one community expert um, that I observed in a, a closed community that does call themselves a cult. Um, they follow this community expert blindly. He has no scientific or medical training at all. And he not only advises them on their iPad use and their iPad harm reduction, but on unconnected issues like diabetes. Not only is there much uncertainty that could result in an increase in harm rather than a reduction in harm, but there is a community culture which may result in harms being downplayed or denied. There is a, a normalization of risk and the attribute, attribution of harm to misuse um, rather than to inherent harms in the drug. The issue is the idea of what misuse is, is evolving in these communities as we see a shift away um, from cycling and taking time off of these drugs towards blast and cruise where these drugs are used continuously. Um, 20 years ago, such use would be deemed misuse. Now um, it has been relatively accepted. I suggest that we've got a great opportunity here. 
I suggest that the best way to reduce drug harm is to bring together the inside and outside perspectives on drug harm reduction, to make the outside perspective on drug harm reduction more grounded in the experience of these drugs and to add more objectivity to the user perspective on harm reduction. So far, we have focused more on the second goal than the first. Given the recent emphasis on science and health monitoring among iPad using communities, there is a great opportunity to collaborate to reduce harm. I think the iPad communities I've discussed today really demonstrate the benefits of a grounded approach to harm reduction that acknowledges harm reduction as a balancing of drug benefit and drug harm and acknowledges harm reduction as a collaboration between outside experts and those with lived experience of the drug who are already always practicing harm reduction. I know this is exactly what Pennington Institute aimed to do, connect science and lived experience to reduce harm. I feel that the tide is turning in this direction. I hope my concept of grounded harm reduction is a useful one to assist these efforts and that we can all come together to build more effective harm reduction practice. I thank Pennington for their efforts to bring us together today, which is a great step in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. That's some really interesting research that you've done there and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to hear about it. So thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. My there pleasure. were questions in the chat, but um, we'll hold those to the end of the session if that's okay for the people who've asked and then we'll, we'll return to those. So we're now going to... The one way that I've done it is that I've looked at the prescribing information for reandrons. You saw the ones we use medically. So it's a very uh, long acting testosterone and looked at the product information, prescribing information, and I've just classified the common side effects in bold, the uncommon ones just in normal print, and also case reports and anecdotes in italics, just to get you some idea that you know, what evidence there is. So testosterone use, we know that acne is a known side effect, which is not unusual, and bolding and gynecomastia are listed as you know, uh, less common side effects. Testicular shrinkage, oddly, is not actually reported in the um, testosterone product, but obviously it's reported amongst people who use testosterone. Um, cardiovascular metabolic side effects, polycythemia, where hemoglobin increases, is uh, listed as a side effect. And we know that medically, that even if you prescribe testosterone as a replacement, this can happen, even at lower doses anyway. So you're not sure how much of it is dose dependent. Um, following on from before, I think what Bjorn said, I mean, I've actually tried to approach the blood bank with an entry point about whether, you know, uh, people with polycythemia from anabolic steroid use can donate blood. And they basically don't have no interest in the topic so far. So if anyone knows we're engaging them, I'll be happy to talk to them. Hypertension, high cholesterol and reported testosterone use, including HbA1c increased glucose. Um, so in the literature, there are anecdotal reports of cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, uh, uh, so cerebrovascular events, thrombosis, conduction, abnormalities, and cardiac death. The problem is it's hard to make sense of this anecdotal report, so reports like this, because one, we don't know what's been used for how long, um, what dosages are being used, and how they have, you know, the overall practice is not necessarily due to one drug, maybe it's due to a significant um, um, body size increase over a short period of time, so a lot of unknowns about it. So we know these things are reported and we're on the lookout for it, but we don't know how common they are. Um, other things that are reported to testosterone is testicular pain as a result, suppression of the hypothalamus, pituitary gonadal axis, so basically suppressing a natural testosterone. Um, you know, there is talk of this anecdotally. We don't know how long it lasts. We don't know how long it takes to suppress it. Uh, in the literature, there's report of some cognitive defects in some people ongoing testosterone suppression and infertility as a result of suppression. Mental health, again listed with um, testosterone use, um, depression, um, during use and after use, other emotional disorders have been reported, insomnia, restlessness, aggression, irritability. Um, the complication of mental health too is that when you're talking about anabolic steroid use, um, you need to think about what's existing before use, um, what might happen during use, or what happen after use in the recovery phase. So they're all quite different conversations to be had. So it's really complex, this area. 
other effects like Bjorn said, injecting site reactions, whether it's just pain from the injection, um, whether it's um, from infections, um, there's liver toxicities talked about before, just reports of liver adenomas in some people, injecting risks. So whilst I don't Look, I don't highlight the bloodborne virus thing. It's part of the talk, my initial talk. That's all. But as you see, it's just part of all the other discussions. Talk about hematoma abscesses, uh, muscle joint pains, uh, creating kinase increases, pulmonary microembolisms as well. Um, one forgotten group is in women. Um, only a minority of the people who use performance enhancing drugs are women. But in women, there are additional adverse effects uh, in addition to what I've talked about, clitoral growth deepening of voice, loss of breast tissue and disruption of the menstrual cycles. So coming to, so those uh, side effects I talk about, this is from the talks that I give to GPs. So I'm trying to actually educate GPs um, and other health professionals about what side effects to, to expect and to monitor for these side effects. That's the main focus of that part of it. So these are the barriers. So how do we find out about the adverse effects of PEDS use? So many substances are not approved for human use. Some of them are vet products. So some of them don't have approval for human use. So there's very little information. Like Bjorn said, the doses used are not, um, even for like testosterone, the doses used by um, PS users aren't those that are done in trials. There are trials, I've found trials from 20 odd years ago where they gave people testosterone up to 600 milligrams a week and saw how much muscle they gained and stuff. But they're the only trials, a handful is two or three trials done in the 1990s, and that's all that's available. So there's nothing um, to talk about any higher doses in that or in combination as well. So different combinations are being used for different time periods, a lot of variables that we it's hard to correct for. Supplies vary in quality and content. Because the supplies are generally illegal supplies, um, there's some studies looking at what the, what the makeup of these uh, anabolic steroids are. And the thing is, most of them have anabolic steroids in them, but not necessarily exactly as it's stated. It might have a different anabolic steroid in it, and also not necessarily at a concentration that's stated. So again, so it's very hard to then uh, attribute side effects to certain products without knowing what it is. There's very little data collection at the moment. For example, if someone presents at the hospital, um, because of the stigma attached with it, I think most people wouldn't actually acknowledge that they might um, use anabolic steroids unless it's absolutely necessary. So I wonder how much is being missed in terms of side effects and stuff. And there's very little background information. Like Bjorn said, we have very little information about this group and we're only starting to look into it a little bit more. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So these are the barriers that healthcare prov provision has, you know, and as, as a GP, this from my point of view, so firstly, there's very few available healthcare providers who have enough knowledge and are willing to, to help monitor this patient. So it's only in the last few years or so, I've done a lot of talks um, to mainly GPs, but other health providers as well. I just done one in Cairns last week as well. So mainly just giving people enough knowledge so they feel comfortable to engage and maybe get more information. At this stage, harm reduction is the only acceptable model. There's no way around it at the moment. I, I get what Omar and um, Bjorn say about this, but I think the only acceptable approach we have is harm reduction, but harm reduction in a way that fits in a bit with what's been talked about. So it's about monitoring um, for side effects and advising on that. Um, there's medical legal matters as well about how much we can provide help with um, that is sort of um, okay. State health laws about prescribing. Each state has a different law of prescribing. Some of the agents using PCT have a different regulations in different states. Generally, we're not allowed to prescribe the things mentioned in PCT unless it's for treatment or something specific. So most doctors will not prescribe. Medicare rules for ordering tests, you know, what tests we can order, how often. It's a bit of a gray area. Um, how, how often can we order tests before we trigger, trigger Medicare to investigate it? Um, and as Bjorn said, some people choose their private testing which overcomes the Medicare issues, but then it comes back again to medical legal issues again. And I, I present this to um, the doctors as well. You know, as Bjorn said, it's huge stigma for someone presenting to forget health, health advice. You know, there's a stigma themselves, the stigma from their peers, big stigma from healthcare providers, totally acknowledge that. Um, there's from family and friends, you know, people think they're drug cheats. 
But I think in certain states, it's even worse, which is New South Wales and Queensland, because it's, you know, it's a class one drug in, in, um, in those states. And someone coming forward has the concern that it might be reported. It's not required for doctors to report, but I can understand a consumer having the concern. So how real are the barriers to healthcare? This was interesting. I was recently involved with a podcast with Health Ed, which provides podcasts for uh, healthcare workers. And before they organized the health, the podcast, they actually did a survey of, of their people, 269 people who use health ed. And they asked if they've ever declined to assist the patient asked for information or assistance using AAS and other performance in, in mission enhancing drugs. And about 40% of many GPs actually said yes to this. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea that um, there is a big barrier that is actually it's true. Um, so a part of education, as in addition to education that I've been doing, um, Dr. Katinka Vanderven from University of um, New England and the Sydney North Health Network put together a group of us to try and come to get to um, produce a guide, a GP guide to harm minimization. It says GP guide, it's really aimed at all healthcare providers. But being a primary health network, the focus has to be on GPs. So this is not meant to be for consumers, um, but it's meant to be for healthcare providers getting more information. So it talks about background, what assessment you need to do, red flags you need to look for. I think this is from a very reasonable um, harm reduction perspective, and it gives us something to sort of direct um, GPs to. You know, GPs will say they don't have enough information, because I hear that a fair bit from GPs is that some GPs uh, they're not that they're refusing care, but they feel like they're not well equipped to provide the care. So we can say there is this resource you can go to to actually do that. Um, in terms of for consumers, oops, wrong. there we go. Um, I, was, I was aware of this because I was asked to just review this website. It's a website called The Juice. It's produced by Hepatitis Australia. Um, so I think it's a reasonable um, website for consumers to go to to get information. Um, maybe short of time, so I was going to go to maybe just talking about, from my point of view, impact of harm reduction, obviously blood-borne virus, which is not a major issue now, but I still think it's important to make sure you are aware of avoiding blood-borne virus risk. Um, from harm reduction, we can reduce the risk of injecting itself, we can monitor adverse events um, and manage them as appropriate. We can have general health advice as well. I think it's a good way to engage people in healthcare and to talk about other things that might not be related to their anabolic steroid use. Um, mental health can be discussed. You know, this is really complex, as I said, because it all depends which stage they're at, at whether they have underlying mental health issues we need to deal with. Uh, referrals. I mean, Melbourne, I know who to refer to. I have a few endocrinologists who I can refer to quite comfortably um, and psychologists I can refer to if I need to, but I think in each state, Need to work out what the referrals, uh, who the referrals can go to, and also discussions about withdrawals. There's very little um, that can be done for someone withdrawing. There's no program we can refer someone into. There's no specialist they can see to help them withdraw. So if someone's been on anabolic steroids for a while and they want to stop using anabolic steroids, for example, there's no easy way around it. Basically, we're asking people to essentially go cold turkey. You know, come off your testosterone and just wait a few months until it recovers, which yeah, I think it's a bit inappropriate. There's no way around it at this point. So one of the things that we are starting is these baby steps. So I'm doing this thing called push uh, audit collab collaboration, which is a which is an audit cross-sectional survey that we started in 2019. It's about to finish in about a month's time. Um, I managed to, to get um, the Burnett Institute to co-sponsor it and provide some um, uh, sort of advice and help as well. Um, I've collaborated with clinics around Australia, Stone Walls in Brisbane, View Street Medicals in Perth, East Senior Doctors Sydney, Holsworth House in Sydney and Brisbane, and Hobart Places in Canberra. So we've got multi sites around Australia, and we're basically collecting the data, sort of the collecting data about people using anabolic steroids. I think we'll have 150 plus, which is not huge, but it's actually a useful number. You can get some data about side effects, who they are. This is really just a starting point. I think it's just a stepping stone to actually do further study. Where to from here? I think we need to increase the number of people engaged with this, which we're trying to do, and hopefully this will improve over time. And then once we've got the health providers, then we can encourage this population to engage with the appropriate healthcare, which is, I think, the next step. 
And I think we need to create pathways for referrals as well later on. These are all things that we need to do, but I think we're very, very early in, uh, in the process at the moment. Thank you. And thank you so much for that, Bing. And uh, your time management is superb. So well done. I'd like to uh, open up the um, chat for questions now for Maya and for Bing. Um, we do have one that I've that's just come in that I can start off with. What kinds of withdrawal symptoms are associated with coming off these drugs? So I mean, essentially. It's you become testosterone deficient, that's the main thing. So, you know, you, you remove your um, exogenous testosterone and steroids, your body is not producing much testosterone. So you'd be very, uh, you feel very flat, often you feel depressed, very lethargic. Some people find it difficult to do anything, like you know, go to work, go to the gym, all the regular things you do. Um, people find very, very difficult. I think there's definitely scope in the future where people like this can be helped to actually regain their testosterone whether using some of the other agents or on low doses of testosterone to recover, but this is essentially not available at this point. Thank you for that. And there were some questions earlier for Maya there. Um, one of them was here, any comments on those using, not in the, the professional circles, um, but in other circles such as school students or people in gyms, how they can get information? Well, unfortunately, my sort of knowledge of the user perspective is limited to those people who chose to engage with me. Now, I wasn't paying anyone, so I tended to attract those users who see the value in science and want to contribute to science. So I tend to get these expert users, as they're called, very risk averse, um, tend to be well educated, um, aiming for that evidence-based practice. Um, so they, they are not the majority of users. They are in the minority, but they are a very influential minority. So every user that I've ever spoken to has gone online for information. If they go to Reddit or they go to a forum or you, you will usually find these expert users there. And they, whilst they're in the minority, they're very influential in the way that they talk about these things. So it's, um, I think, a great opportunity to engage with these expert users because whilst they're in the minority, they do have such an influence on the broader mm. community. Um, so, uh it's, I haven't, and I must admit, I haven't worked with anyone, you know, under the age of 18, because ethically, uh, that would be a whole nother project, uh, maybe a future project. Um, but yeah, so my knowledge is limited, but I do find that online is where people get most information. Can I just comment on that too? I think just expanding on what Bjorn said, I think it's important to reiterate that I think the majority of people who use these substances are using it for more body image. So it's only the minority who use it for competitive purposes, whether it's bodybuilding or power sports or anything like that. I think that's where sometimes it gets a bit confused. People assume that people who use these substances will come in really large bodybuilders, but most of the people I see in general practice are people who just look like they're fit from the gym. So I think it's a totally different thing. And that's one of the things I talk to people about too. I think the online resources are good, but sometimes they're following the program for a professional bodybuilder. And I say, well, you know, if you're not doing that, you probably don't need to go to that extreme. If you're gonna use anabolic steroids, you might need lower doses, you know, less intense programs might be appropriate. So I think there's a bit of adjustment. I think the education is important to actually um, teach people the fact that, you know, a lot of gym users use anabolic steroids nowadays. That's the reality. So there's no point having stigma or anything about it. I think we just need to engage and, you know, provide information. Yeah, I think you're right there, Bang, that some people will uh, go into these forums and they're looking at the protocols of the top competitors yeah. um, and those sorts of people. And some of them will want the belonging in the community. And so they will perhaps start using drugs like insulin and so, because yeah. that's what the hardcore bodybuilders do. And now I'm playing with the big guys, you know, sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, there is 
some sort of normalization of protocols that are probably beyond what your average user would need. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Thank you. And another question was around the difference, any research on the differences between um, other illicit drug users and iPad users? Is there any research on this and what does it say? Yeah, well, look, if, if you're looking at needle sharing and things like that, uh, the amount of needle sharing is uh, tiny in, in comparison to, say, needle sharing by heroin users. Um, there isn't if you think about it, there isn't the high that um, is involved with mm. other recreational drugs. Mm. So there's not the desperation factor. Um, there's not, there tends to be, at least amongst the users that I have spoken to, um, they tend to use by themselves. It's not a social thing. So the risk of bloodborne virus is again reduced. Um, the guys that I speak to is very careful and considered use. They, they treat their body as a temple. There is no way they're going to be using a dirty needle or sharing needles with people. And so anecdotally, I mean, I, you know, I can't speak for everyone who uses anabolic steroids, but, you know, over the years, I've seen quite a few hundred of them, I suppose. And I think one of the big differences is, is that people who use anabolic steroids are interested in self-improvement and their health. You know, they're not getting it, they're not using it because of any other effect from it. And there's other substances, people have some other ben, you know, other benefits they're trying to get from it. But it's actually about their health. So these people are interested in remaining healthy, exercising, you know, getting the most out of their body. And anabolic steroid might be part of the equation of achieving that. So it's quite a different mindset, I think. And I think that's why they don't like to be lumped in with everyone else as well. We also had a question about um, people who use image and performance enhancing drugs in the regions, in particular um, people who are new to it. And if you have any recommendations for referral pathways and resources in the regions. <laughs> that says it, I think. I think there are hardly any referral pathways in the cities, so in the regions it's no better. I think the fact that if someone makes a contact with an NSP worker, that's fantastic and provides as much help as they can. And if they have access to you know, health services that are useful, but I don't know where they are, so I don't have an easy answer to that. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, let's see, oh, there's lots of comments coming in. Um, we have someone talking about experience with um, PED users injecting each other especially as initiation. Is anyone able to comment on that? It's not the type of guys that I talk to. Yeah. As I said, though, there is a, there's a great diversity of users and I'm talking to this expert user, very risk averse, it never happens. And, um, and they're very aware of bloodborne virus and they feel stigmatized by talk of bloodborne virus. There are, as, um, the typologies that have been suggested in the literature, there are the YOLO users um, and people like that where I presume this happens more often. I've tried really hard to recruit those guys, uh, but they're too busy living once. You know, they don't want to contribute to science like the expert users do. I think I would need to be paying them to talk to those sort of guys. I think I've heard it talked about the whole, you know, buddy using system where they inject each other. Um, some, it's one of the things I ask before I go into the blood one virus discussion is I ask how they use. And like my, my say it's most of them inject by themselves or some of them have someone they know who will inject them. So there's no, it's not injecting each other. So then there's no need for that further discussion. But I've heard of buddy using in the past, but to be honest, not for a long time. So I don't know if it's just fallen out of favor. What about uh, steroids being cut with other substances? Tegan, who's up in uh, Gold Coast, has um, heard stories of the steroids not actually being pure steroids. I don't know much about it. I haven't heard much about that. So I can comment on that. I don't know if Mars heard anything. There is research that shows that um, that has te have tested various steroids for what they're purported to contain and have found that often they don't contain what they're purported to contain. The, um, the strength of the steroid may vary widely. The fact that it 
it might not include, not even include the steroid that it's purported to claim, um, it purported to include, is very dangerous, especially for women who are perhaps in avoiding certain compounds before they're androgenizing, they're masculinizing effects of them. If they think they're getting something that is not going to have those effects, but they're actually getting something different, it can cause a lot of harm. Okay, come back to, I just noticed the written question before about her injecting each other and there was a part of it talking about shared bowels. I think that's a different thing because most of the anabolic steroids are come in multi-dose bowels, like 10 or 20 doses per bowel. So one of the things I talk about is the risk of obviously bacterial infections in multi-dose bowels. But I've had the odd person who has talked about whether they can share the bowel with someone else. So I suppose that's where the whole cross-infection conversation needs to be had and if that happens. So I think that is happening occasionally. And Bjorn has um, responded to uh, one of the comments by saying underground labs in Australia are based on reputation. Poor results will filter through the community. You typically avoid exotic compounds as they are much rarer than others and more likely to be faked. So mm -hmm. thank you, Bjorn, for that response as well. Um, Joshua asks, what are the legislative barriers? Are there other countries where iPad use is legal? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't think there is, to be honest, but yeah. I'm not sure. There are. There are. In the UK, um, iPad use is legal, uh, personal use, but you cannot manufacture or sell iPads. Um, in a lot of Asian countries, you can buy um, steroids and other image and performance enhancing drugs over the counter. Um, interestingly, it is those countries where there isn't a hugely muscular ideal. Um, so there isn't this um, demand for, um, for these drugs to be used illicitly. Um, and you will see people go on steroid holidays to say Thailand or somewhere uh, where they don't have the law against it to to have a holiday whilst having a steroid cycle. And we've also seen in the chat, chat, thank you Bjorn, users in the US will drive to Mexico, Australians will fly to Thailand. So um, there are clearly other countries that uh, with different legislative regimes that are enabling this kind of, as you say, the, the steroid tourism. And it has a big impact on harm reduction in different countries. So in the UK uh, is very focused on harm reduction and there is very little on how to help people stop using. But then in countries where it is illegal, there is much more emphasis on providing services for people to cease use, but not much on the harm reduction during use. So it's, it's a really interesting situation. Ideally, we bring it all together and provide everything. And on that issue of, uh, of the other substances, the lack of purity, um, Chris has said uh, a lot of users may be obtaining supplies that have little or no testosterone in them. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maya, for dropping that PDF for those of you who haven't seen that. No, an article. no problems. That's a, that's a commentary I wrote on, um, on this particular segment of the iPad using community and their attitudes to the focus on bloodborne virus in research and service provision. Um, as I said, all research is limited. My research is limited to a certain segment of this population and I don't claim that it represents all. Uh, you will see much more reckless use and uh, you know things in, in, uh, amongst other iPad users than you would see amongst the guys that speak to me. And there's certainly lots of uh, comments in the chat about stigma and the continuation of stigma that we're seeing um, for this cohort as well. Um, let's just see. And the last comment there is from Samantha Jones, public perception of what any injecting substance uh, user looks like is hilariously misguided. Also the idea that we use only for enjoyment or escape. For some, our use is very much for enhancement, maybe just not physical. The us and them we all create still is disappointing. So lots of lots of discussion of stigma there. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm going to stop at this point because um, there's uh, just one last thing that we would like to say. I'm going to turn over to uh, Matteo.
So thank you so much for to both our speakers there and for those questions. I'm just going to have uh, Matteo come in for a minute and then I'll come back to uh, wrap up. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been uh, really avidly following the discussion. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much to Bjorn, to Ben and to Maya. The reason I'm briefly on your screens, and I do apologise for the moustache to sort of bring, um, for bring down the tone a little, is... Um, just to actually uh, promote the most recent issue of the bulletin, uh, which was published yesterday. It's a frontline publication that we do for NSP workers. So hopefully at least some of you on the chat are already aware of its existence. Now, the reason I'm specifically plugging uh, yesterday's issue, and I've actually just dropped a link to that issue uh, in the chat so everyone can click and have a read and subscribe, is that there's actually an article in there about PIEDs or, or iPads um, Beng is quoted in the piece, um, uh, and I believe the author of the piece may be on the call at the moment as a participant and registrant. I'm not going to call her up and bring her on stage virtually, though. So really encourage everyone to, to have a read. Um, obviously, subscribe if they, if they um, enjoy the article, and obviously to thank Beng for taking part in the article. Thank the author. Um, who I'll sort of do the favour of not naming. And um, yeah, again, just thank everyone very, very much uh, for registering and all the presenters today for making this a wonderful seminar. Thank you, Matteo. And the other thing that, uh, the other link that I've put in the chat was to our Safer Using series, the, um, the booklet on steroids. If you'd like to have a look at that on the Pennington Institute website and you can, uh, you can pick that up. So thank you to everyone for, uh, thank you to our speakers in, in particular, to Bjorn and to Maya and to Beng. Thank you for the attendees and for your excellent questions. A reminder, please, to uh, complete the survey if you can. Um, there is the link again. Thank you, Anna, for that. And um, let us know what you think. And uh, as always, get in touch with Pennington Institute if you have questions, if there are any further topics that you would like to see in our seminars or in our bulletins, um, anything at all, do feel free to get in touch. So thank you all for a really interesting session. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>